everybody welcome to common sense urology where i go over common urological problems and offer a sensible approach to them i'm dr neil gordon and today's topic is urinary stones or calculi if you want the flash word if you like what you hear and see please consider giving a thumbs up and also consider subscribing don't forget to click the notification bell down below to hear of many more episodes to come now it may interest you to know that urology is the only specially mentioned in the Hippocratic Oath, where it says, I will not cut for stone, leaving that to people of expertise, specialists in the field. Now the stones Hippocrates was referring to were in fact bladder stones, which often developed in men as the result of prostatic obstruction. And what he meant by cutting for stone was a perineal urethrostomy and cystotomy. What happened was that the patients would be placed on their backs, four assistants would come along, one would sit on each shoulder, one would flex up each thigh onto the chest and a cut would be made in the perineum. The operator's fingers would be passed into the bladder and the stones pulled out that way. Of course this was not a very good procedure because many men died either of haemorrhage or infection, or both. If they did survive, they were often permanently incontinent because just like a river, the urinal take the line of least resistance. And if there's a big opening in the sidewall of the bladder and prostatic obstruction, which of course led to the original pathology, then the urine will flow the easiest way out between the legs. So the men were totally incontinent as a result. Nearly all seven or eight year old school children have done an experiment at school where they've half filled a glass and made a concentrated solution of salt or sugar. They've then placed a pencil across the top of the glass and dangled a string into the glass. That then enables crystals to form on the string and those crystals grow and form a stone. This is pretty much the same way that stones form in the urinary tract. Usually there's a concentrated solution and quite often a nidus of a few small cells which have come from the calyces within the kidney. These subsequently grow into stones. The classic presentation for urinary tract stones is with extreme pain on one side, radiating from the flank to the groin, sometimes into the testes in men or in the labia in women. These are often described as the most severe pains a person has experienced and it's a waxing and waning and hence the name colic, pain that occurs. A lot of women who've had children will say that this is even worse than having childbirth. Classically, these patients will move about trying to get comfortable and don't sit still. And what they really want is pain relief. So after taking a brief history and examination, the best form of pain relief is with non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. The best way to administer the non-steroidal inflammatory medication is with a suppository. I use endomethacin 100 milligrams and that works extremely well and it does take the same length of time to work as an intramuscular injection of a similar sort of substance. Often these patients are vomiting and are dehydrated and narcotics tend not to be as effective as the non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. In addition, narcotics tend to make some patients vomit, which clearly is already happening with their condition anyway, leading to further dehydration and further discomfort. So narcotics are best avoided. The first investigation to be done is urinalysis. It's likely to show microscopic hematuria. If that's accompanied by leukocytes and nitrites, then a specimen must be sent for microscopy and culture because it's likely that infection is present. Next thing is to send off haematology and biochemistry because you need to know how well the kidneys are functioning to order your next investigation. The patient should then have a CT scan without contrast first of all, but it's also useful to have one with contrast if the renal function is normal because the second kidney will provide a normal urea, creatinine and EGFR in most patients. The addition of contrast will show whether the kidney is completely obstructed or only partially obstructed. A KUB film should be taken and KUB stands for kidneys, ureters and bladder, which is taken lower in the abdomen 
to include the lower ureters than an abdominal film. If you ask for an abdominal film, it will be taken with a higher projection and you'll miss the lower ureters. There are three relative narrowings in a ureter. The first is at the pelvic junction. The second is where the ureter crosses the iliac vessels. And the third is where the ureter enters the bladder and that's the narrowest of all the openings. Of course, it can get obstructed any way along the pipe at all. Now the size of the stone is important also. Most adults will be able to pass a 5mm or less size stone in approximately 85% of cases. If patients have previously passed stones, then it's quite likely that they will pass this one. Most patients do not need to be admitted to hospital. If analgesia is achieved in the emergency department, they can be discharged home on indomethacin 100 mg suppositories PR 8 to 12 hourly as required. An appointment should be made at urology outpatients for further advice. If a patient has an obstructed infected kidney and presents with fever, sweats, rigors and also has cloudy urine, microscopic hematuria, leukocytes and nitrites as well, then this patient does require to be admitted to hospital because an obstructed infected kidney can be very serious. The patient needs to have the obstruction relieved and that can be done with a ureteric stent which is passed through a cystoscope up to the renal pelvis and the kidney subsequently drained. Manipulation at that time can increase the incidence of bacteremia and septicemia. So it may often be better to have a percutaneous nephrostomy inserted in the radiology department under local anaesthetic and CT or ultrasound control. A good choice of antibiotic is gentamicin 3 to 5 mg per kilogram in a stat dose intravenously plus ampicillin or amoxicillin 1 to 2 grams intravenously stat also. Kidneys which are not obstructed do not require stenting unless they're solitary kidneys. These patients may be able to be discharged and followed up in the clinics it has been shown that human kidneys may be obstructed for up to three months without any deleterious reduction in their function when unobstructed later on, providing that there is no infection. This is a summary of presentation, diagnosis and early management. This shows a non-contrast CT with a stone in the left upper ureter. This is the same patient following contrast and multiple renal cysts can be seen. In addition, the normal right side can be seen to be easily functioning. This shows a stent beside the stone. This shows a plain KUB film with a stent in place. The options for treatment of patients with upper tract stones are extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy, ureterorhinoscopy and percutaneous nephrolithotomy. Occasionally laparoscopic approach is carried out and also occasionally an open approach. Lithotripsy is the generation of sound waves across a spark plug using an electrical current of approximately 20,000 volts. This is focused on the stone using an image intensifier C-arm X-ray machine. The setup can be seen here. The sound waves are focused in three dimensions as shown in the focus of this cross wire here. It is quite loud so hearing protection is used for all. These are the stone fragments passed. This is a demonstration of a ureterinoscope in the renal pelvis and how it can be manipulated. This shows a calocele calculus, which is about to undergo laser treatment. As you can see, the laser fibre on the left, and the stone is gradually disintegrated into fragments, which can either be extracted, washed out, or passed by the patient. Treatment of stones below the anterior superior iliac spine is usually carried out using ureteroscopy 
laparoscopy, open procedures or occasionally lithotripsy with the patient face down. This diagram illustrates ureteroscopic stone extraction. The LMA Swiss lithoclast is like a mini jackhammer and that's being used to break up this calculus in the lower ureter. The black guide wire can be seen in the 4 o'clock position. That can be used to pass a stent if required at the end of the procedure. In this case, the laser is being used to break up a lower ureteric calculus. Calculi can be extracted with a parachute basket. It is passed beyond the calculus, opened and then withdrawn, capturing the calculus. At the end of the procedure, contrast is injected up the ureteroscope on the final inspection. If it flows cleanly and easily into the bladder without any hold up or obstruction at all, then it may not be necessary to put in a stent. If however there is hold up, then a stent is a good idea. This is because no matter how careful we are when we go from outside to inside, there's a risk of introducing infection. And infection in an obstructed infected kidney can become bacteremia, septicemia and very, very complicated. Occasionally there's a little bit of leakage from the kidney and extravasation is seen at the level of the kidney where the calyces join the pyramids. This is usually because the irrigation pressure, although very low at about 60 centimetres of water, can cause and a small amount of fluid can leak out. This will seal up with drainage from a stent. Stent insertion. In guide wire is passed up the ureter and then the stent passed over the top. The markings are every five centimetres and go one, two, three, four. So when 20 centimetres is up, there are four markings. This patient's actually had a bladder tumour resected from this area, which is why it looks the way it does. The stent is pushed up until it reaches the renal pelvis as shown on the image intensifier under which control it's carried out. Once the stent is pushed up there, the pusher is then placed against the stent and the guide wire withdrawn, allowing the curl at the bottom to deploy. This is a picture of the upper end of the stent in a contrast filled kidney. This is a KUB film of the stent in place. Stents should be left in for as short a period of time as is possible because they're quite irritating. Patients with stents should never have their urine alkalinized because the phosphates can deposit, then calcium deposits, and then a stone forms on the stent.
Likewise, patients with catheters in should never have theirs alkalinized either. This is an example of a stent on which stones formed. Stones should be analysed and this is the approximate incidence accordingly. Patients with bladder calculi usually present with lower urinary tract symptoms and they complain of pain at the end of micturition, stop-start micturition and macroscopic hematuria. Bladder calculi can be crushed and evacuated, lasered and evacuated or undergo open removal. This is an example of a bladder stone being crushed with a stone punch. To do this, the stones should really be three centimetres or less in diameter as the instrument won't be able to grip them otherwise. Stones bigger than this should undergo open surgery. This is because it takes a long time to laser them and a long time to try and crush them up and is largely a waste of time and money as a result. This is a guide to the steps involved in cystolithotomy. It's quick and easy and usually takes about 20 to 30 minutes and saves a lot of time in theatre. This is an example of a calculus removed that way and these are calculi removed from the one patient. Calculi in pregnancy present a problem. Generally they are best left until after the baby has been delivered. However, lithotripsy can be carried out in the upper tracts in the first eight to ten weeks. Approximately 30% of patients will make another stone sometime in their lives. If two stones are made within 18 months, further investigation should be carried out. These are the investigations that may be helpful. If a patient has a high calcium level, then maybe a parathyroid hormone estimation should be carried out also. From the point of view of prevention, hydration is the key. A squeeze of lime, lemon or orange juice in water will help with those patients who don't like the taste of water. Uric acid calculi may be dissolved with alkalinization and may also be reduced with alkalinization or the assistance of allopurinol taken regularly. In general, a good fluid throughput with citrate from fruit, a mild salt restriction are more likely to be followed than anything more restrictive. Thank you for watching this presentation on urinary tract calculi. I hope you've enjoyed what you've heard and got some good information from it. If you like what you've seen and heard, please give a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe and click on the notification bell for many more episodes to come. Cheerio.